will tell you, if anybody's listened to me for a while, you know I describe myself as the most blessed man you know, and I don't know who's in second pl- place because I'm that far ahead. <laughs> I now know who's in second place. Michael McCleavy's in second place. You have lived a charmed life. And how do I know that? Because I've read his book, right? What now? What next? Where to? And I, you know, we had a mutual friend, Tom, Tom uh, Blake, who goes, oh, because he was friends with Johnny Cash. He goes, well, if you think that's impressive, I got a friend who's, who was friends with Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be you. Man, what, what a life you've lived, young man. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. And Melissa is so so loving it. I I know, but the the stories you have and 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 the way things have happened for you, because I read about your your childhood in Scotland and you fell in love with with rock and roll music and 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 it and you had a chance to be in a band that you formed in school and that you're obviously well good looking enough young man that the girls went crazy and you had a great big fan base and 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 then you decided well, I'm going to go to America. I mean, how does this, t- let me through the thought process on that. Okay. So in, in school, um, I had a bunch of friends who, who vocally would always be singing. We'd go to, to their homes and they would set up chairs and everybody would sit in those chairs and the person's father says, right, who's up first? So we started to sing. Each of us had a song. So that was how we developed singing amongst one another. And then I was sitting in a cafe in, in a, my hometown, Rutherglen, outside of Glasgow. And I went up to the jukebox and I pressed All Shook Up by Elvis Presley. Now, I never, no, hey, I had this voice, but never, you know, that record come on, All Shook Up come on, everything changed. I wanted to be saying, not like Elvis, to be myself, but I wanted to be something like that. So that's, um, when I get into a rock and roll band, the Fireflies. And so the Fireflies and I toured and did everything we could to make it. You were very successful. Well, we, we for, for, for a glass school boy, we were pretty damn yeah. good. Yeah. I we, um, we toured quite a bit. And uh, so that's how we, that question that it developed into that. Now, what made me go when we did our thing, we won our, our major contest, we were get offers, but there was something lacking. I was something not quite right for me. I can't remember Elvis. Then I started to see him on the movies and I said, well, when I went to another hall to see Blue Hawaii. And I says, you know, guys, I says, yeah, I'm going to meet that guy and I'm going to go there. Oh, you crazy nut. Come on, get out of town. So that's how it began. I says, well, okay, laugh at me. Okay. So that's how, does that help and understand that? Yeah, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing that's crazy. There's a lot of people who say, yeah, I'm going to go and meet Elvis. <laughs> and 99.99% don't get even to see him in concert, much less meet him, right? That's right. And, and, and it's, been, it's been this amazing life. That's, it's fun that you met Elvis, and I, and I, and I want to talk about that. But, man, your life has been, you would not recommend people to do it the way you did it. I mean, it was crazy how... Okay, I'm going to go to America, y'all. I've had this success, and I can make a proper living here in Scotland, and I can do this, and I can be a, I can be a star, and who knows, maybe I can even become a national star in Scotland, because if I've got Glasgow, 
I, you know, that's a big start. That's a big start. And, and, but I'm going to go to the U.S. And then when you get to the U.S., it is amazing how many things just happen for you that people would go, oh, hey, you know what? You would probably be a good assistant for the actor uh, Lawrence Harvey. And, you know, he was in my one of my favorite movies of all time, which was uh, The Manchurian Candidate. Uh, and, and he was the Manchurian, you know, okay. and 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 it, the fact that that, you know, reading it in your book, you just go, you know, hey, and somebody said, well, what are there? And I got to meet him and we did this and it was fine. And it was I mean, again, if somebody told you that story to your face today, you'd be like, wait, now <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the times were different. Yeah, don't have today. You couldn't. You know, the, it's different times, and I didn't look at it any differently. Um, in the sense that I was coming to another country, and it was all open for me. So I didn't realize. Oh well, you can you can't do this, or you can do that. This is. This is uh, why? Why not? Why? Why can't I go to to Hollywood in a in a scooter? You know, uh, I I didn't quite understand the reasons. So with Harvey, um, I uh, lucky enough I knew this gal, and she said, "How would you like to go and work for Lawrence Harvey?" I said, you mean Lawrence Harvey, a uh, mature candidate, uh, the um, Butterfield, you know, all these movies, um, Dandy and Aspect, uh, all of these stuff come in my mind. Okay, um, so I went to Harvey. I went for the interview, and he was, he was great. He said, okay, then here's what you do. You drive me to the studio, you take care of my guests, and I have a lot of guests, and there's parties. And you're going to be greeting them. So that, so the big party comes, and there's who walks in? Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Austin Wells, and the neighbors come in, Doris Day, Bill Lancaster. Huh? Where am I? <laughs> Well, uh, Michael, uh, Michael's from, from Scotland. Oh, Michael, uh, you know, as if I was one of them. And I had to just talk, just keep talking. That's what they said, keep talking. And I really gave me a lot of freedom. Wow. You know, that's then, not uh, right. then I met a, a lovely lassie, Sharon Tate. Oh, and that's we, a tragic um, story. We're three good friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never forget uh, her, her natural, being so natural, and walking along the beach, just talking about her upcoming uh, marriage to Roman Polanski. And, and then I went um, more than two years later, you know what happened. So, so uh, stay with me this, to this day. So that's how uh, the, the circle came around to, in Harvey's house. It's just such an amazing story. And let's be clear, and, and, I, and I'm not meaning to embarrass you, okay? So let's understand that. Okay. You were a beautiful young man with a wonderful accent, right? I mean, because, right. you know, I mean, you, I saw the pictures of your youth and stuff, and oh my goodness, I probably would have had 15 to 30 uh, illegitimate children. I would have, because <laughs> I would have played that card and I'd have been like, you know, so you, you beautiful people who were able to like not let it turn your life wrecked. I mean, well done. <laughs> uh, but, but in the fact that you got the opportunity and yet you were talented enough to handle the opportunity that you could meet Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. and engage them in conversation. You could make Lawrence Harvey feel comfortable that, you know, that you understand how to read him uh, because I'm sure there were days he didn't want you to talk to him in the car. And then there were days he wanted you to talk to him in the car and you had to in instinctively know that right right I mean, you're when i read your book i'm like you know i'm going to tell you this michael you short 
change your people skills. They are next flipping level. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and and it's it's fun that you you went to Hawaii. You went to Hawaii for why? Why did you go to Hawaii? Why did you? I'm in Los Angeles. You know what I'm going to do? I I'm going to move <laughs> to Hawaii. <laughs> okay. Even you, now that I say it out loud, you realize how crazy that was, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know, that was, uh, after Everest, that was the other, other thing that they left me at in Scotland. That after I made the movie, now remember that, they laughed. Okay, then? Overlooking diamond heads. Hi, guys. Remember? <laughs> well, you got to Hawaii, and and somebody offered you another job. Probably the richest people in Hawaii, and we're okay. Like, yeah, what are we going to do? We're going to we want you to give tours, and we want you to just take care of things, and and you know, and that's what it it was amazing how people found you and gave you opportunities, which was cool. But then the amazing thing, the best part of this story is you knew how to take advantage of. It. Of not the people of the opportunities, yeah, yeah, because everything was a uh, 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 to do to, to make money in Hawaii, you had to do two jobs, and when you didn't have any experience in areas, you had to take what you get. So, uh, um, when I arrived there, I met um, uh, Marshall Hall. Now, Ma how did I meet Marshall Hall? I just didn't go off the plane and Marshall Hall was standing at the airport waiting on me. No, yeah. no. I, I looked in the, in the newspaper and said, um, apartment for rent. And so I went to this and it was a home. It was the old style Hawaiian home on Royal Hawaiian Avenue, 352, Royal Hawaiian Avenue, right, right across from the... Um, the uh, the pink palace. Do you know where the pink palace is? <laughs> I I don't go to Hawaii well oh, enough to, uh, <laughs> to know <laughs> it. <laughs> the Royal Hawaii, the, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. It was right across the street yes. from there. And, I, um, I know that. Yeah, and he um he does home, and he says, "Oh uh, yeah, I have a room, and uh, my uh, I just need you. I'll give you a cheap rent, but I need to be driven around town." He was a famous explorer. And so everybody knew this guy. So I, I got a reasonable rent. And then I got a job uh, at the Royal Hawaiian News, driving the newspapers around, putting them in the box. And then I got another job at the top of the other guy. So I saw the three jobs going at one time. And that's how um, I made a, bit of, a few bucks. And then, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to ask: Were you still singing? Were you still Were you still singing and doing? I didn't sing until I got to Molokai. I'll tell yeah. you. So, so when I I worked at the top of the Molokai, and George Murphy, who owned a big ranch in Molokai, is who I served. Him and his wife. And so, he asked me, "How much are you earning, young man?" And I told him. And he says, how do you like to triple that and come and work in my ranch? So I said, uh, okay, I, I, um, can, do I have to answer you now? He says, oh, no. He says, um, here's my telephone number. You, you call and um, mention your name and uh, let me know. So I did. I, was like, I said, why am I even waiting on this, you know? Why don't I grab it? But I didn't want to, I wanted to tell Mr. Hall, here's my thoughts. And, and so he understood. And he said, use the phone. Take, can't take that job for God's sake. So I did. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, he said, I'll have a plane waiting for you at Honolulu Airport. So I'm thinking, I'm going on a twin engine jet plane to Molokai? So the day I went to the airport, there's this little took chrome propeller thing. <laughs> so it, it takes off, and the whole the, the trade ones are blowing. I see diamond head on the left hand side. I see, well, we're not. Is this a way to go? I'm going to end up in the middle of the crater there. <laughs> but anyway, we, we landed in um, 
multi wallet. I said to the pilot, "What's the what's the um, airfield?" She says, "I said right there. It was actually in the middle of a field. The big ranch house was right there, and they circled the ranch house and landed in the field." So I, my job there was to greet the guests again and show them where to, to hunt for boar and stuff like that. There was no, it, it, you, all you could go is with jeep and horse by ride. That's the only way you could around the island. And then he says, um, now you told me at the, in the Ilakai that you used to sing. I said, yeah, I, I used to be a singer of a rock and roll band. He said, well, we have a quartet here. Would you like to sing at nights for the guests? So I got extra cash doing that at night. <laughs> so wow. that's how I, the, what you said, to answer your question, one way would they? Yeah, I sang again in a way. <laughs> well, because it's just such a fascinating story. And like I said, when I when I read it and and you know, the, the draw was, well, you met Elvis and actually he knew who you were. Well, that's a big deal. Uh and and to have that kind of goal of going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet this Elvis Presley guy. And for it to happen, I mean, again, now that you can look back on your life, and even though it was a different time, that's crazy that it happened. It is. It's just absolute. I, I've been in the music industry for, gosh, a long, long, long time. And I probably have met four or five people total who have had a relationship with Elvis Presley. It just wasn't something that happened to everybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what I mean. Yeah, I know. It was, it was uncanny. It was, it, it, but I think the circumstances that happened made it even better for the for the actual meeting. Because if you recall, I went up to that house originally in a motor scooter, and he was he wasn't there, and they needed invited me in to show me the house. And I just walked around and the door. Why? I'm Michael McClurgy from Scotland. I came all the way to meet Elvis. Well, he's not here. He's, he's um, on vacation. He's back in Memphis. But he'll be coming back. And his valet, Richard Davis, who used to, you know, get his clothes ready and so forth, was in the house. He says, oh, he says, um, I'll tell you what. He says, uh, why don't you come back? He's coming back in a month. And just come up to the house at night. Well, okay, tell me that. The little square went up there. And. <laughs> oh, my little skinner! <laughs> and uh, so I, I missed him that night. And then I called a, a, a Sunny West who. It Sonny West was one of his buddies. Yeah. And he, he got to see me at the gate. And he said, you know what? He says, I'm sorry you missed Elvis. So why don't you come back another night? I says, okay, what night? <laughs> so he says, Friday night. So I guess... So instead of going on the scooter, I asked a, a girlfriend of mine, can I use her car? She says, okay. She says, can we have a bag by 10 o'clock? Got, you got it. So this is for me. Elvis, it's, it's about probably, oh, 815, 820, 25. So the world's voice draws out in um, paraging away. It's a circular drive in, in Bel Air. And, have, and Elvis, Sammy's driving the car and he goes, and Elvis is in the back seat and he drive, they drive in and they close the gates. So, and there's a bunch of girls everywhere there, here, you know? And so, uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes, um, somebody comes to the side gate. It was some Agada thing. He says, uh, Michael McCleary said, yeah, it's one me. And he's standing outside 
the front door of the house. Don't get anyone inside. Just stood me there. Says, you, you wait there. So, nine o'clock comes, nine fifteen comes, nine thirty comes. I says, I, it's going to take me 25 minutes to get back to Santa Monica. Uh, I got to go. I gave her my word. Then I left. Just as well. Because my new doing that, when I called Sonny the next day, the steward, he says, Elvis came out and said he wanted to meet the Scotsman and he's gone. And he says, Ah, oh, damn it. He says, I understand. You had to get that car back. Don't, Michael. Elvis? I said, oh, sorry, I have a, have a screwed up, of a blown it. She said, no, he says, here's another number. Call Tom Diskin. Now, Tom Diskin was Colonel Tom Parker's assistant. And so when I called Tom Diskin, he says, okay, Michael, you don't have to say anything. Can you ask at racetrack in Torrance? And 8.30, uh, say Tuesday, Tuesday morning. 8.30. So I took the day off work, drove down there early, and I got the VIP treatment, the gate, come on in, blah, blah, blah. And Sonny saw me, then he came, and he, um, he said, okay, Michael, you sit there, and you don't move. So I, I got a chair, a director's chair, and then on the right, is Elvis Presley, and then another chair, Deborah Lally. These are all the other stars in the movie. Uh -huh. And about 10 minutes later, who comes forward? Elvis. Five guys in his left, five guys in his right. I mean, I could be some crazy man, right? So yeah. I mean, he's, got his, he's got his end target. He's, he's got everybody there. He just, then he goes, Hi, Mike. Sorry, I missed you last time. Welcome. And that was it. That was the whole start of a great day. He'd, he'd send me there, he'd come back, and he'd say, how are you enjoying yourself? He, he talked a little bit about Scotland, how he, he landed there on his way home from the army. Um, he spoke at the be about the Beatles. He spoke about... Guy by the name of Jimmy Savile, who was a DJ, we we had heard about. Um, a, a, just a gracious man, just wow. a gracious man. And, yeah. And during lunchtime, we sit there, and, and I just observed. I mean, I used to be I I can talk okay, but that time I just was reserved and I observed everything that was going on for that whole day. And then at the end of the day, after eight hours, being the Elvis, he walked me to the gate, shook my hand and said, don't be a stranger. And that was it. Wow. Wow. You know, again, your instincts are amazing. That you knew not to be weird. That was what was going to be required of you. Don't be weird. And you sat there and you were gracious and you talked and you didn't try to make it about you. And and you could see where if you're Elvis, that's cool. That you're you're just there and you're being a part of what's going on and you're appreciative. And now we're done. Right? That's because yeah. and, and and knowing it is a very underrated skill in in knowing how not to be weird in a weird situation. And that was a weird situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, well, well, I think uh, I think you got to understand that you can, you can overwhelm when you want it. You think you, if you think you're good, you can overwhelm mm -hmm. by how you act. Yeah. And when you get in a position like that and you say, Keep your trap shut and enjoy. 
<laughs> Sounds <laughs> easy, doesn't it? Sounds <laughs> easy. The majority of people can't do it. I tell you what, we're going we're to come back with more memories because, again, it's crazy. It's just his, his life story is just so much fun. But this is Michael McCleavy. We're going to be back with Here's What We Know right after this. It's time to think differently when it comes to your parties, meetings, and groups. The catering from Havana Cuba Restaurant in downtown San Jose. Instead of the same old, same old, how about the most delicious Cuban sandwich you've ever had? You're tired of fries? Plantains, my friends, they'll change your world. And here's something you didn't know. Havana Cuba was voted one of the top 10 tamales in the entire South Bay. They have vegan, vegetarian, and gluten-free options, and their website is 998cuba.com. They're located at 387 South 1st Street in downtown San Jose. It's Havana, Cuba. So the fact that Elvis knew your name. Hi, Michael. How are you? And what? what actually what, Mike. He said Mike. Mike. Yeah, yeah. But how, him- what, what, what stood out to you in the in-person meeting? What, oh. what stood out to you about him? Do you have a way to describe what made him Elvis? Well, man, if you, uh, he's a, what a good looking man. Jeez. He, he was just a handsome man. And for a guy to say handsome, yeah, you know, just a, a presence. You know, uh, they, you, you know, some people and some emotion in the room, and it just takes over. That's what happens when I was, he comes into your company. Just the whole presence. You're you're not the only like, TG Shepherd who was a friend of his. Uh, yeah. and TG had told me the same thing. He goes, It was hard to meet him for the first time because you just didn't want to stop staring at it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, and and that's again, I think you and TG both had that innate ability to go, well, let's not make this weirder than it's gonna that it needs to be. Because he goes, you really just do. You just want to sit back and go, how can anybody's hair be that thick? How can anybody's eyes be that, you know, smoky? How can anybody's lip curl like that? That's just not normal, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, and at the time, sure. and, you know, and, and and he was like, I met Elvis when he was still in shape. And when Elvis was in shape, there was, as you said, I think he said, there was just there just wasn't a better looking man on the planet. And you could throw Marlon Brando and Paul Newman and all those guys. Nobody could stand anything when, when Elvis was at his top of his game. There just wasn't a better specimen, you know, of, of manhood uh, uh, available. Yeah. Uh, that's like, that's what you get. That's when you see it for the first time. You, 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 you look around and there's Elvis. You know, it's just a different, different concept of a power, a, a presence. Just to be, just to see someone having that type of presence, and you can learn from it too. Is is seeing? Can you? Can you? When you're when you walk into someone's company, how how are you coming across? You, you, we all can learn fr- from Elvis. Just by how the presence comes, how he carried himself. What did? How did you learn? I mean, like what? Well, I need to know these things. I want to be Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't of, sing. I can't, I can't sing at all. Well, well, I said, "What well, my one makes work too." So, work too. What can? How can we do to improve ourselves? Well, you know, don't let the old man in. That's Clint Eastwood says. Yeah. Keep your old man out, right? So do uh-huh. the things that you, you still like to do, that you did do, and with some reason, do it. I, I, I like that because you, you've obviously learned a lot. I mean, it was, what kind of different energy was there between Elvis and, say, you met Frank Sinatra. Again, I, possibly he's one of the top 10 most iconic figures of, I would say, the 20th century. Correct. Frank, another different different element. Slow, slow, slow moving, slow talking, get the mic, get a Jack Daniels, light a cigarette. I've got you under my skin. I mean, but Elvis, 
Clifford again. Boom, boom, boom. No, she got one. No, 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 no. No, just movements, right? So, so, and he's all, and he's all nine and all success, and, and he has a great record. Two different elements. You know, and look, you can't, it's a lot of zombies, right? You can back and you can compare. You know, and they both loved to have guys around them that made them laugh. I, I was talking about when T.G. Shepard was telling me, he goes, you know, Elvis was funny. He, he told me some of his stories. And I'm like, hey, T.G., I think you got this wrong. And he goes, what? I said, you were funny. Elvis loved to laugh. Oh, right? Yeah. right. And, and, and it's the same thing with Frank Sinatra. He loved to have enjoyed Bishop around. He loved having guys who would make him laugh. But yeah. I don't know if but Dean, Dean Martin, very funny. Right? But right. I think when you're the cool kid in the room, you're not making people laugh. You're laughing, and they're looking for that approval of your laugh. Yeah. And he's like, okay, well, I can see that. I'm like, you know, and, it, and it's okay. It's, it's, we all need a role. We all need a role. Yep, yeah. Now, I, thought, uh, I tell you a thing. I, when I, I also met Tom Jones. Tom I Jones, love Tom Jones. I love him. Big Elvis fan. Yeah. And... So it, it was at the Green Theater and went backstage. And um, so they were telling the Bay Elvis. And I says, uh, so I said, can I ask you a question, Tom? I says, um, what was the, did you ever, what was the one that you got when you were with Elvis? And did they ask you anything out of the ordinary? He says, no, he did. He says, you know, the Beatles split up. Um, and you and I like to sing together. So, what do you think? Now, this is the Elvis Tom to Tom Jones. What do you think that you and I get the Beatles as a backing group and sing for us, do a show? Tom says, Are you? Yeah. Yeah, he says, I didn't know what to say. Was your, you know, was Tom Jones talking about that in some stations, but that, not everybody loves that. Yeah, yeah, think about that. Let's let's wrap our head around that. Yeah. Elvis Presley wanted the Beatles to sing back up for him and Tom Jones. Yeah. Oh, what's new, Pussycat? Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've always loved Tom Jones. I, I had a chance to talk to him once, and he was simply the most gracious man. My sister was the biggest Tom Jones fan in the world. And I told him that. I said, my oldest sister is just, she just loves you so much. And I said, could you, could I just tape you saying hi? And I just thought he'd go, hi, Barbara, this is Tom Jones. And, you know, hello. And he did this like minute thing where he was like, hi, Barbara, my love, this is Tom Jones. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of your life. And he did this like minute long thing. And I'm like, and you know, and here's the other thing about Tom Jones, fantastically wealthy, fantastically wealthy. So he didn't have to do any of this. This is back when he did the Prince's song Kiss and he had that little resurgence of pop. Yeah. And so I was on a pop radio station. He didn't have to do a dang thing for me. But the fact that he did that and made it such a pers personal moment, I think that's the difference in the, the stars of the day. It's not a criticism because everything's on video now. But that having that moment where he would go, thank you. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you a little piece of me because you've given me all of you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So it's... The, the, You've, and I found that with um, a lot of those folks, very gracious, very gracious people. Because they know what they know what it's they know what it's like when when they had a like when Tom first met Elvis, he says I was a nervous wreck. This is Elvis, the guy I was listening to when I was a teenager. And I'm 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 here, and and Priscilla's right there next to him. You know, it, it's just. Well, I saw all I all I think, who did you who got you going? Who who got you here? Well, over, I don't know for Elvis. Well, I'm saying we're talking to you. 
You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's uncanny. If I tell the, the guys I grew up with in Scotland, you know, I'm going to be doing a, a podcast today with it. With a radio host, a guy Scott Thomas. Huh? Well, put him on a time, Mike. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because man, again, this went back. I mean, you go through all this, and then and then the opportunity arises for you to sell insurance. <laughs> and and I just talked to a, a comedy club owner who told me about the you know he, he goes I had twelve different twelve different jobs, and he goes I was selling insurance when I started a comedy club because I was like this is the worst job ever. <laughs> and I knew I was going to be talking to you. And I'm like, not if you do it right. I'm going to be talking to a guy who did it so right. I mean, okay, the career you ended up with, you couldn't have it today. They would be requiring your MBA and you would have had to have all of this and this backing and all of that. I mean, but you were literally the art of the sell because you're so gracious and you understand people. And you listen to them and you give them the reply that they need. Boy, you you in that industry was just the perfect, the perfect match, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I was very lucky too, because in a full enterprise system of the United States, the world, I mean, my first time with you, Gary, I had a, a a sort of world, world kind of suit on with a, a tie that was so covered it looked like uh, Dolly Parton records. It was, I was, I had a little, little bush on and my hair was long. And I walked in from my first time of year. I looked, I looked at some of a teenage magazine and I'm coming to for an insurance interview. Um, but I was, but the, the manager, he took a line to me. And he says, okay, I'm Michael. He says, let me ask you a question. What would your market be? I says, oh, Ralph's. It's just down the street from me. So he was very gracious. He says, well, man, I don't know that type of market. I mean, people. What type of people would you be able to to, to, you know, talk about financial planning and, and retirement. I said, well, I know a lot of Scottish and English and Irish and Welsh people in Santa Monica. I said, well, you, you do a market survey for me, put the names down, and let me have a look at them. And that's how it all started. And... And all I was told uh, uh, when I did my initial presentation to a group of guys sitting at a table on a Monday morning, I know they were looking at me saying, well, I don't think this guy's going to last uh, probably, maybe I will give him about three weeks. And then I remember, remember the guys in the movie in Blue Hawaii when I was walking out said I was going to do this and going to do that. Well, I took the same format. And I said, okay. To, I said to the guy that was training, I said, what do, you, what do you need to do here a week? He said, if you do three sales a week, you'll never look back. Nuts. I went in there, and that's what I did. And it just skyrocketed from there. Well, you did three sales a week, then you started doing 10 sales a week. And I mean, you know, you your numbers were gobsmacked is what you're, you know, the, 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 and the fact that, like I said, you, you, you got into this industry and it seems like, uh, seems like the good Lord's always had a good plan for you. Like, ah, let's, uh, let's get you over here. Yeah, you met Elvis and now we're going to do that and ah, we're going to move you this way. And the talent that you did, and that's your superpower, you know, again, you are gracious. And you listen, and you find out what people need. And then you reply to that. And you're, you had an amazing career in the insurance industry. I mean, you made it to the top of the top of the top. Yeah, I, I, uh, I said that, and I, I did it because 
the challenge was there. The ch there's always a challenge. You need some sort of challenge. Hey, um, and I would remember I had to, I had to go and take a longer road to get my eventuality. If you remember, I wanted that. Uh, I wanted something, and they said, "Oh, you're going to wait because we're going to consolidate." I said, "Well, I'm not waiting. I went to somewhere else, and did what I had to do there, and then come back to get what I initially wanted." All those years ago. So, to just. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. What can I say? <laughs> no, it's what I'm saying. That's what. Remember how I started this? Remember how I started this? I'm the most blessed man you know, and I don't know who's in second place. Until now. <laughs> Until now. Because when you were given these opportunities, you expanded them. Not only did you take them, but you expanded them. Right? right? I mean, you have a chance to meet Elvis, you expand it. You have a chance to go to Hollywood, you meet Lawrence Harvey, you expand it. You go to Hawaii, you get an opportunity, you meet somebody at a restaurant, you go from there, you expand it. And that is, it's, that's why I, I, as you can tell, I really did read your book uh, <laughs> and, and enjoyed it. And, and it's just, it's been it's 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 so much fun to watch this journey and to see what you're doing now and and what are you doing now? A lot of traveling. I well, we've done a lot of traveling, Linda and I, my wife, and uh, so we decided to hang out here and go a point to the beach. And we don't travel as much as we used to. We don't. There's no. We had a a cat by the name of Elvis, and we're seventeen. So if we go too far, he might kick us out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to be around the guy to make sure that uh, everyone's working for him. Really, <laughs> the schedule is pretty tight, Gary. <laughs> you know, you should you should go to a bar and see if you could find some kid from Scotland who come in and take care of them for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, you could tell him that, I, yeah. <laughs> Michael McClavey, I've had I, I've looked forward to this conversation because I've just enjoyed it. And I just wanted to sit back and go, wow, again, this story, I wanted to see how it happened. And now that I get a chance to talk to you, I get it. <laughs> I get it. I get why I, I I get what it is that you do. You know, and and my only complaint about the book, and because you're too modest, you short sell yourself, you know, because because there's no way the, the things, the opportunities I kept going, wait, and did and then that happened. Hold on now, wait, where's he at now? And then that happened. <laughs> and and the fact that you always took took it and made it bigger and better than it ever started off as. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for letting me uh, be a small glimpse into your life. I found it interesting and fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Gary, for having me. I really appreciate it.